day and welcome to the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky Health Equity Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Rochelle Seeger. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you joined us this afternoon for this Health for a Change webinar. Again, this is Rochelle Seeger. I work here at the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky as a Community Health Research Officer. I'm honored to have been working here since 2013, and I work on the Foundation's data initiatives. That includes the Kentucky Health Issues Poll, the data website KentuckyHealthFacts.org, some other research projects, and this fun piece of work that I get to do called Health for a Change. This is a training series of capacity building webinars, just like we're on today, and also in-person workshops. To uh, share with you health advocates across the state of Kentucky, some important information, new information, or we have different trainings on capacity building and different workshops. I'll have a schedule upcoming in just a moment. The Foundation for Healthy Kentucky was founded in 2001, and its mission is to address the unmet health care needs of Kentuckians. The Foundation does its work by developing and influencing policy, improving access to care, reducing health risks and disparities, and promoting health equity. This training series, as I mentioned, is part of the Foundation's work. It was started in 2011, and we have reached every county in Kentucky uh, with Nearly 3,000 participants have participated in our Health for a Change events. Many of the past webinars and slide decks are archived on our website. That's the Events tab at Health for a Change on the Foundation's website, healthy-ky.org. As I mentioned, the upcoming schedule events. Um, next week we'll have a webinar on planning for success. That will be on strategic planning and the MAP process, so all you health department folks that are on the line will know exactly what I'm talking about. Please feel free to join us. And it will be part two of this webinar on July 11th. So please mark your calendars for 1 o'clock July 11th. We'll be thrilled to have you back. Uh, we see some workshops. The August 16th workshop will be down in Bowling Green, Kentucky in partnership with the Warren County Public Library. And September 27th, we will be in Northern Kentucky, partnering with Northern Kentucky Health Department and Interact for Health, great partners in some of those events. Right now, I want to turn the call over to Maureen Silver and Laquana Williams of the Prevention Institute, who have lots of experience working with health equity, and I'm so thrilled that they're here with us today. Welcome, Maureen and Laquana. Hi, thank you so much for the, the warm introduction. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, as Rochelle mentioned, my name is Maureen Silva. I'm an Associate Program Manager here uh, at Prevention Institute. And my background is in nutrition education and food systems. And in my role at Prevention Institute, I have the fortune to be able to work with coalitions, uh, communities, and organizations across the country to be able to provide training and consultation, moving folks really from service-based models to helping them think about the ways in which that the community environment impacts health, especially around supporting healthy food and activity in communities. And so I also wanted to introduce you to my co-presenter today, La Laquana Williams, um, if she'd like to give a little bit of an overview um, on herself. Hi, good morning, everyone. As Maureen mentioned, my name is Laquana Williams, and I am also an Associate Program Manager here at Prevention Institute. My background is focused in health equity um, with some experience in local health departments here in California and uh, a new role here at Prevention Institute focusing on our internal um, and external health equity um, programs and practices. Thank you, Laquana. And so to put our talk into context today, um, I wanted to share a little bit more about our organization, Prevention Institute. We're a national um, nonprofit based in California, but we have staff in many parts of the country, including Texas, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and D.C. Um, and as Laquana mentioned, um, as well as myself, we really bring 
um, expertise into this work through our experience working with community in different capacities. And this is something that we value among all of our staff that step into this work at Prevention Institute. We have a broad range of staff expertise from violence prevention to mental health to healthcare and nutrition and land use planning. But no matter the experience of any given uh, staff member, we have something in common that brought us to PI. Each of us have observed through our own either professional or sometimes personal experiences that to be really effective in advancing health, uh, safety, and equity, um, a, a multi-sector approach is the thing that's needed to be able to go beyond a focus from the individual to really thinking about what does it take to move upstream. So together as an organization, our primary objective is to help organizations, coalitions, um, many groups that, that many of you might represent um, start to grapple with some of the more difficult questions, like how do we do quality prevention in a way that prevents illness and injury in the first place? What are some of the most impactful strategies for achieving prevention and health equity? And how do we do prevention work in a way that recognizes the interrelated health and safety issues um, and, and show that those um, connections are there and start to break down some of those phylums? So we answer those questions by tra tracking the research, um, by providing training and coaching to multiple groups and sectors, as I mentioned, and by talking through a lot of those promising strategies, tools, and frameworks that are emerging from community initiatives. And this is the piece that we'll talk a little bit more uh, about in um, the kind of end piece of our webinar today. So in working with communities and groups across the country, we know that creating healthier communities needs to really be grounded in health equity. Um, this is something many of you all may have heard a lot about. It pops up in grants. It, it is something that we hear in conferences. It's something that we know needs to be fundamental to the work that we do. But what does it actually mean when we, when we talk about it in practice? So I wanted to start off um, with you all um, just in answering this question, in your opinion, how would you define health equity? So using the text chat here, um, you can go ahead and just write in your response, and we'll go ahead and kind of shout out the different responses that we hear. There are no you know, right or wrong answers, so don't feel particularly shy. This is really kind of a space for us to get the juices flowing, to think about um, what health equity means when we work in some of our communities. Um, so just take a moment to start um, plugging away some of your responses. This can be um, based on definitions that you may have heard in the past. It can be um, kind of uh, imagery or other things that have come up for you when you think about health equity. Um, so just, just take a second to start responding to that question, and then we'll, we'll kind of ground it in some of the, the language and, and things that we're hearing about. I'm seeing, I think, a couple of folks typing. Equality, okay, yeah, that's that's definitely a piece of it, um, which we can we can get into a little bit more. What else is coming up for you? Another person responded with all individuals having access to health care that addresses their needs. Um, that's, that's definitely a piece of equity and, and having accessible and also quality healthcare that all individuals um, can utilize. Absolutely. Other things that are coming up, and this, these can be things that are happening in your own communities. Um, another <clears throat> person mentioned taking down barriers to health, promoting easier opportunities for health, thinking about creating barriers even unintentionally, and I think that's a major piece when we think about um, how inequities really started out in the first place. And I think that when we get into equality, some of the, the things that a lot of folks mention are, well, what is the difference, or, or how do we kind of break down equity versus equality? And when we think about equality, that's, that's really assuming that all folks are kind of starting off at the same exact place. And what equity does is it says, we think that people should all have equal access and fair access to health, but it acknowledges that folks are starting out in really different places. So um, low-income communities, communities that have been disinvested in, communities of color are starting off in, in different 
um, places, and therefore we need to be kind of thinking about um, an equity approach. Another response we, we received here is health equity promotes fair distribution and allocation of resources to meet people where they are at exactly, and that's, that's really the, the element that I think we'll be getting into today. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a great graphic that shows equality versus equity with bicycles. Absolutely, I, I think that we've really been drawn to that as well. There's a lot of graphics out there, and that's been one that I think really kind of depicts equity in the way that we would want it to be showcased. Um, so a lot of you have, have got to this point already, but we wanted to show one definition here um, that speaks to us, um, which is from Paula, Paula Braveman, um, in, in a recent publication that says, health equity means that every person, regardless of who they are, the color of their skin, their level of education, their gender or sexual identity, whether or not they have a disability, the job that they have, or the neighborhood that they live in, has an equal opportunity to achieve optimal health. And so we want to encourage healthy and equitable communities for um, people to grow up in, um, but also great places for people to, to grow old. And for people to fully engage in their communities and be healthy, we know that the built environment must be able to address these needs. And so um, what does equity and inequities look like when we start to kind of break this down? This was a campaign that was launched several years ago in California by the California Endowment that in just a few images shows the importance of place. We know that entire communities, um, typically low income and communities of color, face more inequities every day like you know, lack of access to clean water, unsafe housing, limited park access, lack of healthy retail options. I'm sure many of you can point to um, a longer list of, of pieces that come up for you. And all elements that we need to be healthy um, are embedded in this. Um, and a lot of the times what we see is that their wealthier counterparts have more, more access to equity. So we can he see here that in Stockton, this is the zip code on the left-hand side, there's a 15-year difference in life expectancy compared to Newport Beach, which is the zip code on the right. And even though in this example we're looking at Stockton and Newport Beach, we know that these same inequities exist in communities across the country. Um, this is not a new concept of, of kind of looking at zip code in place. Um, we know that where we live matters, and as we work to change health and truly make health for all, we need to be acknowledging and addressing community factors when building our coalitions and accessing the right da data um, engaging folks and communities to help inform our initiatives versus only providing services. So services is a large part of it, but we need to be talking about um, equity in the context of our communities where we live. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next pre presenter, Matt Ruther of the Kentucky State Data Centers to talk a little bit more about data and some of the work that they've been doing. Thank you, Maureen and Laquana, and uh, welcome everyone. So you've gotten a good overview of what health equity is, so I'm going to jump right in um, with uh, some slides on some information about the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender population, which I'm going to refer to as the sexual minority population. And so I'm going to start just by um, showing some, some information about the health disparities that this, that this particular population exhibits. And, and first, sexual minorities are more likely to exhibit many health behavioral risks than our heterosexuals. And this varies a lot by gender. So for example, in these tables, um, we can see the number of individuals, the percent of individuals that exhibit for poor health behaviors, um, smoking, binge drinking, obesity, and the presence of health insurance. Gay men are more likely than straight men to have health insurance, but are less likely to exhibit any of these these poor health behaviors. They're less likely to smoke, less likely to drink, less likely to be obese. However, bisexual men are more like heterosexual men in, in all of these four behaviors. On the side of women, though, we see a very different picture. Lesbians and bisexual women are by far practice more unhealthy behaviors than do straight women. So for example, more than 20% of lesbians and bisexual women um, ex exhibit binge, binge drinking relative to only 8% of straight women. And so, of course, these health behaviors have some effect on the outcome, the health outcomes of these groups. 
Sexual minorities have poor physical and mental health relative to heterosexuals. So some of this is related to the previous slide that the health behaviors, but there's some unexplained differences as well, um, including access to care. So this um, graph here shows the odds of an individual having low self-rated care, self-rated health. Self-rated health is a, a measure of, of, of an individual's own health, and it's been shown to be a fairly accurate assessment of, of, of where individuals stand in, in their own health. The blue lines, the blue bars here, show the odds that a, an individual has poor health. And so we can see that where the blue line crosses this, this 1.0 bar, there's no difference between straight men, which is our, our reference category here. And you can see that women, straight women, lesbian, um, lesbians, and bisexual women all have poorer health outcomes than do, than do heterosexual men. But we do not see the same thing with gay and, and bisexual men. When we take account of the differences in behavioral risk factors and access to care, these odds change a lot. And the, the women, lesbians and bisexual women, both become more like straight men. So some of what we're seeing in the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual community in terms of health outcomes is the result of differences in these behavioral risk factors and in access to health care. Historically, gay men and, and lesbians and bisexuals have had more limited access to health care, and some of this is related to the fact that our health care comes from employers, and a lot of times um, the uh, unions that sexual minorities enter into are not recognized as such by employers. However, we've seen some changes um, due to recent legislation, um, Oberfelge, Oberfelge uh, Overfelge, I can't remember the other name, but U.S. versus Window, the two the two Supreme Court cases that um, um, gave that expanded health ac healthcare access to the sexual minority dependent population, um, and also the Ameri the Affordable Care Act, which has extended service uh, health services to lower income Americans. And so, what we see now, um, this is a, the odds of having. Um, of having unmet or delayed medical care due to cost reasons. We don't see any differences between the lesbian, gay, bisexual population and the straight population in having access to health insurance. So everyone has access to insurance. Not everyone, of course, but within these groups, everyone has access to insurance. The difference in giving care, though, is, is a financial one. So individuals are less likely to be able to afford the care outside of the insurance. And we see this among most groups. So white males, both gay and bisexual white males, um, are less able to afford care. And lesbian, bisexual females, white females, and also bisexual non-white females. All of these groups are less able to afford care. And so afford the affording of care is obviously as important as just having health insurance. And so it's important that we recognize this. We have recently seen that because of those Supreme Court cases, that the odds of having access to care and not having to delay care by partnership status have changed over time. And so in this first column here where you see the odds of no health insurance, married heterosexuals, married LGBs, partnered LGBs, and single LGBs all have about the same odds of having health insurance. The one group that stands out here is unmarried but partnered heterosexuals, which have greater odds of having no insurance. But we do see some differences in the cost of care among the other groups. So all of these groups, partnered heterosexuals, married LGBs, partnered LGBs, and never married LGBs, are more likely to de de delay care for cost reasons. And most of these groups are also more likely to de delay care for non-cost reasons, which would be things like unable to schedule appointments during working hours, unable to get to uh, doctor's appointments, or not wanting to, for whatever reason, uh, go to the doctor's office. So finally, I just want to note that the first step in addressing these disparities that we see is the identification of them. So if we don't know that they're there, then we obviously can't attack them. And we need to know their causes. And so a lot of the work that's happening research-wise today is looking for these causes. And much of that work is being done with newly available survey data um, on the LGBT population. In the past, we've had very limited data on this population, um, but this is changing, changing rapidly. And so I'm going to talk today about four um, major surveys that we use to study LGBT health. 
These are the National Health Interview Survey, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and the National Survey of Family Growth. So the National Health Interview Survey is a program of the National Center for Health Statistics at the CDC. It's the first health program, the, health, the first health interview survey, the first health survey that the United States has done starting in 1957. Uh, sexual minority populations were first identified in 2013. So from this point on, we can tell what respondents are um, a sexual minority. It's a fairly large survey, approximately 37,000 individuals per year, which is, which is pretty substantial, and it has a fairly good response rate of 80.5% uh, conditionally. There's four core components of the National Health Interview Survey. They sample, they speak to the household head, they speak about the family, they talk about one adult in the household, and they talk about one child in the household if a child is present. And the questions that are asked relate to health status, health outcomes, health-related behaviors, and access to health care and health services. So it's a pretty broad um, survey. The sexual identity question asked in the NHIS is, which of the following best represents how you think of yourself, lesbian or gay, straight, that is not lesbian or gay, bisexual, something else, don't know the answer. We know that the way that questions are phrased have a lot of, have a lot of meaning in how people interpret them. And so this, the, the phrasing here is meant to convey a whole lot of different options. I just provided here in the bottom some statistics on the number of respondents for each of these categories um, in 2016, which is the most recent data available. And we can see that among both males and females, approximately 2.5% of the population um, responds as being either gay or bisexual. And there's a, a missing other category that is mostly missing individuals. So we assume that the, the gay and lesbian population, based on this survey, is about 2.5% of of the, the total population. And we'll see that this number varies somewhat by survey. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and NHANES, also a program of the National Center for Health Statistics, was started in the early 1960s. And since 1999, it's been continuous. So it happens in two-year cycles every two years. And so the most recent data that's available is the, the cycle 2015-2016. They've asked questions on sexual orientation and sexual behavior since 1999. So there is this, this time period of, of data that we can look at, that, can track, that we can track how these questions have changed over time. It's a little smaller than the National Health Interview Survey. It's about 5,000 individuals per year, and these come from 15 randomly selected country, counties in the United States. And Haines is different than the NHIS in that there are there's an interview section in which they, some of the same questions are asked, demographic, socioeconomic, dietary. But there's also actual lab examinations where they take blood samples, um, they do measurements, um, and a whole bunch of different, uh, more in-depth uh, measurements of uh, an individual's health. So we're not taking uh, an individual's, not that people necessarily would lie, but we're not we're actually seeing what the, 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 the data says about these individuals rather than just taking their interview answers. And Haynes is a little different in that it asks questions both on sexual orientation and on sexual behavior. And of course, these are two very different things. The sexual orientation question is very similar to the one asked in NHIS. Do you think of yourself as heterosexual or straight, homosexual or gay, bisexual, something else, or not sure? There's a second question that asks whether the individual has had any sex with a man or any sex with a woman, asked of the opposite sex. And so we can see not only people that identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, but also people that are behaving in gay, lesbian, and bisexual um, relationships. We see slightly different numbers for the number of individuals who are identifying as gay or bisexual. Here we see about 4% of males and almost 7% of females identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Among behavior, we see even higher numbers. So while 7% of uh, females identify as lesbian or bisexual, 9% of females have had any kind of sex with a woman in, the, in their past. And so these are individuals that are maybe harder to reach um, for reasons, um, for obvious reasons. 
The third survey I want to talk about is the behavioral risk factor surveillance system called the BRFIS. Um, the BRFIS is also sponsored by the CDC, but it's administered by, by states. So every state does their own BRFIS, and the CDC sort of oversees the whole um, procedure. It was started in 1984, went nationwide in 93, and data on the sexual minority population has been available since the 2014 survey. It is a phone survey. Uh, it was landlines until 2011 when cell phones were added, and it's enormous. It surveys approximately 460,000 individuals every year. The main um, criticism of the BRFIS is that it is a phone survey, and phone surveys tend to have low response rates. So there is potentially some selection bias in the raw data that's collected. Everyone that's selected for the BRFIS will complete a core questionnaire that asks many of the similar questions um, to the other surveys. And some states, but not all, have an optional sexual orientation and gender identity module that is also asked of respondents. Um, and so only those states do we have data on. And of course, like I said, this is many of the same um, health risk behaviors, health conditions, and use of services that are seen in other surveys. So we can see here um, the, the states in pink are those that administer the sexual orientation identity module. Um, Kentucky is one of those states. And so we do have information on, from Kentuckians themselves. The BRFIS is one of the only surveys that also asks about gender identity, and so we have some data on whether individuals consider those, themselves to be transgender. In the United States, approximately a half a percent of males and almost a half a percent of females consider themselves transgender, and this is either male to female transgender, female to male, or um, gender nonconforming in, in some other way. Like I said, we are able to get state-level data from the BRFIS because of its huge size. There's, almost, there's more than 10,000 Kentuckians surveyed, and we see from the, the data on just these Kentuckians that some of the, the health disparities that we saw in the, in the initial slides. So more lesbians and gay men in Kentucky are uninsured relative to heterosexuals, and fewer of them consider their health excellent or very good. So they have lower self-rated health. Gay men and bisexual women are also more likely to be obese. Gay men, lesbians, and bisexual women are more likely to smoke. And lesbians and bisexual women are more likely to binge drink. So we see some of the same behavioral risk factors that we see in the population as a whole. We also see that all LGB, all LGB populations um, in Kentucky have more poorer mental health days than do um, corresponding straight populations. The final survey I want to talk about is the National Survey of Family Growth. This is started in 1973. It operates in five-year cycles. Um, and the same-sex sexual behavior and attractions parts questions of the survey were first included in 2002. The NSFG is limited to persons age 15 to 44. So this is essentially the, the, the ages in which people would be forming families. And is nationally representative, but gives us no information on smaller geographies. It is in-person interviews um, administered via uh, CAPI or administered via handheld computers. And it asks a, a wealth of questions on marriage, partnership, cohabitation, behavior, sexual behavior, contraception, and fertility, maternity, and, and, patern and paternity. Just like in Haynes, we have a question on, from the NSFG on both orientation and behavior. And we see slightly larger numbers of gay bisexual, lesbian bisexual um, in these numbers. And this is because the survey is limited to the, the 18 to, to 44 population. So the younger population tends to have more individuals that identify as a uh, sexual minority. The NSFG is also unique in that it asks some questions on sexual attraction. And so this gives us a, a, a range of where people see themselves on sort of the Kinsey scale, but not exactly. So for example, among males here, about 90% are only attracted to females, and then the remaining 10% are attracted to men in, in varying degrees of, of attraction. The final statistic I want to show is this health, be, health provider question that's asked in the NSFG. And it, this is, in the last 12 months, has a doctor or other medical care provider asked you about your sexual orientation or the sex of your sexual partners? More than three quarters of individuals were not asked. So these are, this is a large number of people who are not disclosing or not being asked to disclose 
something that is uh, potentially very important to their to their their own health. To that end, I want to show um, this final slide. And the University of Louisville has the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health are partnering to present a LGBT health certificate that allows in, that allows providers and nurses and any healthcare uh, professional um, more information about LGBT health needs. It's free to members of the U of L community and, and other community members, and includes and consists of completing some content modules and some patient simulation sessions. And this is unique in the country. More and more schools are, are going in this direction, but this is sort of a, a prototype for other uh, programs of this type. So I apologize that that was so quick, um, that uh, I went through those so quick, but the slides will be available online. And I now want to present the next presenter, uh, Vivian Leslie Bibbs from the Office of Health Equity at the Kentucky Department of Public Health. Thank you, Matt. A lot of great information because I think we really have been um, wanting some of that LGBT data and it definitely helps the work that our office does and I'm sure it's going to help people across the Commonwealth to reach some of these vulnerable populations. So again, thank you. I want to share a little history about the Office of Health Equity. We've been established since 2008. Um, we've been funded through multiple mechanisms, most of that money federal through Office of Minority Health, um, the REACH U.S. grant through CDC, Cervical Cancer Free Kentucky, and, and the last method of our funding has been the Public Health Services Block Grant. The overall, arching, uh, the overall arching goal of the office is, of course, to eliminate health disparities among racial and ethnic minorities, um, and rural and low-income populations in the state of Kentucky, and to promote health equity within our state. Um, you've heard a definition of health equity. Um, I like the middle one, it's in blue. It requires removing all obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and a lack of access to jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, a safe environment, and health care. Um, a little bit about the Minority Health Status Report. Um, we were, are required by Kentucky statute to produce this report. Uh, it's produced biennially and we've been producing that report since 2009. Uh, so what you'll be seeing today is the latest data from our 2017 Minority Health Status Report. We use multiple um, data sources to compile the information that you'll find within the report. Uh, we use our Kentucky BRFAS, we use the American Community Survey, U.S. Census, and other Sentinel surveillance systems. Um, we use this document to help communities, both state and local, to engage um, to understand the social determinants of health and the relationship that that has to health inequities and to engage communities to leverage for, pro for programming, for funding, uh, and ultimately to reduce the health disparities within our state and uh, reduce health inequities as well. So I want to share a few of the key findings from the 2017 report. These, it's just a brief, brief overview. You can find the report. I'll uh, give that to Rochelle where you can find the uh, uh, URL for our uh, full report. But here are some highlights. Um, Hispanics and blacks have higher unemployment rates when compared to their white counterparts. Most blacks and Hispanic residents are, are more likely to be renters than their white counterparts who are homeowners. And research shows that poor health outcomes are those that rent versus own their own homes. Persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a higher rate of obesity than the national average. This is a new piece that we've added into the Minority Health Status Report this year by partnering with our folks in uh, the Department for Behavioral Health and Intellectual and Developmental Dis Disabilities. Uh, that's a vulnerable population that we're embracing and including in our minority report this year. White high school adolescents are more likely to smoke cigarettes than their black counterparts. Black men have the shortest life expectancy of all groups when we stratify that by race and gender. Uh, one of the troubling things in our states is that black infants continue to be nearly twice as likely to die in the first year of life as our white infants, and we're working tirelessly to reduce the infant mortality and morbidity deaths in our state. And the age-adjusted mortality rate for diabetes is greater for blacks than for whites in the state of Kentucky. So if we look at some of this data, uh, in graph form, this is just the unemployment rate in Kentucky by race and ethnicity. 
you can see that Hispanics drive that data with African Americans to follow and uh, whites uh, with the least. And this was just putting it in graph form when I talked about home ownership and rent occupied homes in the state of Kentucky, when you stratify that by race and ethnicity. And you can see that representation there, that African Americans are more likely to rent than their white counterparts. This is a slide on screening mammography rates among Kentucky Medicaid enrollees for women aged 40 to 64 years of age. And this is data just for 2015 and 2016. This is new data that's coming to us through the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program. Uh, they've been allowed access to Medicaid claims data. And what you'll see here are the spots where we're not doing such a good job of getting uh, Medicaid eligible women screened for mammography. So the Kentucky Women's Cancer Screening Program is working diligently in these areas in red to get more women screened from a, a, more women uh, screened. Uh, another registry that we love to highlight within the Minority Health Status Report is the Kentucky Cancer Registry. And I highly recommend for you going to the registry and pulling down uh, information related to cancer morbidity and mortality and incidents within our state. Um, what we have here is incidence rates for age, uh, cancer and mortality, age-adjusted mortality rates uh, for breast cancer in Kentucky, looking at blacks versus whites. Uh, you can see in the two uh, on the left for the incidence rates in the states of Kentucky, the picture looks very different when you look at white versus black. And on the right side of the screen, when you look at mortality rates in the state of Kentucky, it also looks very different from a geographical perspective and where we need to focus in dealing with breast cancer incidence and mortality within our state. A uh, percentage of Kentuckians over 50 who have ever had a sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy by race and ethnicity. Uh, overall, we're not doing too bad in this category. We are getting screened with um, a large percentage of our minority populations getting screened. Uh, where we seem to, to fall short is that screening usually comes uh, with minority populations having a later stage of diagnosis in all screenings, not just, sigmo not just colon cancer screening, but in a lot of our cancer screenings as well. Colorectal cancer, again, looking at Kentucky Cancer Registry data. If you look at the incidence rates on the left and you look at the mortality rates on the, on the right of the screen, you'll see the difference that we're noticing um, by geography for black versus white as it relates to colorectal cancer screening. Overweight and obesity prevalence among adults in Kentucky by race ethnicity, I really want to draw you to the right side of the screen. When we look at obesity rates in Kentucky, uh, African Americans are still leading the way with obesity in the state of Kentucky, 40.2% uh, um, versus 34.2% uh, for white and 30.2% for uh, Hispanics. Uh, I do want to say that when you look at age-adjusted death rates for diabetes by race and gender for Kentucky, uh, the data that I presented in the key findings this just gives you a visual graphic of what's really going on in our state with black males uh, and black uh, females having some of the highest numbers of diabetes age-adjusted death rates in our state. I will say that when we look at uh, when I was showing you obesity, I want to say that we are addressing uh, obesity uh, and overweight education prevention, et cetera, through our state health improvement plan, which has five areas, uh, obesity, tobacco, adverse childhood experiences, integrated integration to health care services, and substance use disorder. So everything that the Office of, Minor uh, Office of Health Equity does tries to align with our state health improvement plan. So we can have... Um, we can all be on the same page in addressing some of the disparities within our state, having more, uh, a more intentional and concentrated effort in decreasing those disparities and inequities that um, are perpetuated through this data. When you look at infant mortality, you'll see the same thing that I was referring to. We're almost twice as more likely, infants are more, almost twice as likely to, to uh, uh, die than their white counterparts in the state. And I am happy to say that we will have 
um, PRAMS data to be included in our 2019 Minority Health Status Report as Kentucky just got, uh, has implemented the PRAMS surveillance system as of last year. So we'll have our first year of data next year to be included in the 2019 report. And this is the average annual drug overdose death rate based on decedent's county of residence. This is KIPRIC's uh, data, the Kentucky Injury Pre Prevention and Resource Center, which really has a wealth of information related to drug overdose deaths and, and uh, other injury-related um, deaths across the state of Kentucky. This is just one that we highlight within the Minority Health Status Report. So what does all of that mean? You have a report full of data, so what does all that mean? So we propose recommendations for our state and local um, partners and local health departments and our, our um, academic partners to really think about what's driving these health disparities, what's widening the gap, how do we close the gap, how do we look at, at health inequities across the state, and what can be done to, to allocate resources, staffing, and funds to really work on some of these issues. So we really collect the data to, to have a very comprehensive picture of health is, issues affecting all Kentuckians. And I think Matt said it best, um, it, you know, we really haven't had a lot of data uh, in past years when we look at race, ethnicity, and gender, and we try to stratify um, by those key indicators, and we try to look at some different things. So and if we don't have the data, we can't say anything about that population. So it's been very important that we continue to collect this data through surveys and surveillance systems um, and be consistent in collecting that data, especially uh, as it relates to we feel like there ought to be at least five minimum, minimum data elements that we collect, and that's race, ethnicity, sex, primary language, and disability status. So all of this information comes before policymakers, researchers, healthcare workers, community leaders that can use this and think about social determinants and how that impacts health outcomes when they look at this data. They can develop initiatives to increase social capital, resource availability within their communities. They can reduce physical and social barriers um, to healthy lifestyles. They can increase pedestrian-friendly design in neighborhoods, health, access to, to healthy food options, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also want to, um, oh, that's a duplicate slide. Sorry about that. Health equity moving forward. Um, we want to continue to use the health equity framework in our work, um, identifying and recommending policies, strategies, and actions that can eliminate disparities. We want to align our work with our state health improvement plan, which I mentioned earlier. We want to continue to work on a mobilized, statewide, comprehensive, community-driven, sustainable approach to combating health disparities and health inequities. And we want to encourage and support a health in all policies and decision making across other sectors of state government. We want housing and transportation and parks and rec and our corrections cabinet to all see that the policies and programs and things that they have in place have an impact on health, especially for certain populations. So I want to leave you with this slide. Doing health, health equity work is about changing the way we do our work, not just adding new work. And I love that quote because sometimes we think we've got to do so much more and have so many more people and do so much, so many extra things, but it's really not that. It's just changing the way we think about it, reframing how we address issues, and the way we do our work. So I want to turn it back over now um, to Maureen and Laquana to kind of finish up. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, this is Laquana, everyone. Um, and so, as we sort of work to um, advance our slides, we have um, a question here, a prompting question for you all to think about. And um, as I go through the course of my slides, I ask that you feel free to type into the chat box and answer this question here. In thinking about the health of people in your community, what do you feel is most effective in preventing problems from occurring in the first place? So uh, Vivian actually mentioned the word social determinants of health, and so thinking about those root cause issues of health inequities, what are you seeing coming up for you? And as you all type those in, I can come back to them. So what I have here in front of you is um, our tool 
called the Two Steps to Prevention Tool. And uh, Prevention Institute developed this tool and this framework to help expand the understanding of how to systematically move from thinking about disease to actually thinking about the underlying causes of disease. And this framework here provides a, a visual of how inequities are created and where primary prevention strategies can be um, most effective. So what you see on the next slide is sort of a, um, a new term that I think might be new for a lot of you, and it's uh, called diabesity. And um, this is actually a, a book that was written um, by Dr. Francine Kaufman, and it is about um, looking at uh, underlying causes of um, both obesity and diabetes and how um, the two, when they're paired, actually um, perpetuate diet-related chronic diseases. So as we take two steps pr to prevention, oftentimes we think about um, diabetes and we think about it really just being a medical condition in and of itself. Um, but what we know to be true is that there are lots of other influences related um, underlying causes that um, contribute to diabetes. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind as we think about these things are, are really health care. And while um, improving the system to ensure that quality and affordable care is critical for um, reducing inequities, we also understand that health care does not um, stand alone in eliminating these inequities. So by design, healthcare generally treats people um, sort of one person at a time, and after they're already sick or injured. Healthcare is not uh, the primary determinant of health, as we discussed earlier, but it's also the shift from thinking solely about services um, to thinking about preventing diseases in the first place. So exposures and behaviors. Um, let's take another look at uh, how these impact our health-related outcomes. Uh, there are several types of exposures and behaviors that lead to different health outcomes, and this is one example of inactivity that we see very frequently in children. So whether at work or at home or at school, um, time spent in front of the computer or watching TV or playing computer video games, uh, and as opposed to time being spent outdoors or engaging in some sort of physical activity, um, we, see, we see multiple platforms, media platforms specifically, that are you know, sort of combating our children's ability to actually go out and be exposed to the world so that they can combat the issues of, of diabetes and obesity that we mentioned previously. And then what's happening in the environment, when we take another step, we see that um, we all know of a street that looks like the one in this photo. And so uh, the question is, if this is your neighborhood, how does that actually impact your behavior? And how will that in turn impact, the, impact your health? Um, how are the choices that we make impeded on by what we actually have access to? So these gears here are another tool developed by Prevention Institute. And as a result of multiple overlapping and interacting policies and practices um, that govern our built and physical environments, we see that some neighborhoods and communities in the United States have physical conditions that promote health and others that do not. Um, and so many of the circumstances in communities of color today are the result of historical land use policies and practices that actually barred people of color from being able to live, work, or spend time in certain neighborhoods. And this visual shows some examples of that. Um, you see things here like Jim Crow laws, and we understand that many of the circumstances in communities today are really a result of historical land use policies and practices. Um, and then uh, zoning laws where we're looking at rules that actually categorize white neighborhoods as residential, while communities of color, particularly African American and Latino communities, um, were really characterized and categorized as commercial or industrial or mixed use um, communities. And we know that that impedes on um, or creates health inequities as well. 
So decades of poor land use decisions facilitated by a complex system of weak environmental laws and regulations, poor enforcement, fragment authority, fragmented authority, um, all of these things have really led to the per pervasive overconcentration of environmentally hazardous land use and exposures um, in African American and Latino communities. We also um, see here uh, issues around suburban investment and disinvestment at the urban core. So at the same time that public and private disinvestment from the urban core toward the second half of the 20th century was mirrored by increased investment in suburban community development, we saw investment in urban parks decreasing and highways that were built as part of the urban renewal um, with funding from the Federal Aid Highway Act cut through many urban parks and neighborhoods, which really divided families and neighborhoods and undermined locally, locally owned businesses. Uh, these highways fragmented many historically mixed income, African American and Latino communities, and reorganized the urban landscape. As we also look at small business practices, we see that uh, more recent policies work to deteriorate the built environment um, in these segre segregated communities of color. And this fueled higher density of alcohol outlets in communities of color and communities with low average household incomes. So what's the result of all of these um, policies um, that have been in place for a number of years? Uh, we see that the gears in the previous slide really work to create together to create this perfect storm of inequities in the built environment. And this image is telling of the disinvestment that's occurred uh, fueled historically by current day policies and practices. And we see these images in many of our urban communities across the United States. And like this image, we can also see that um, poor zoning laws and small business practices and disinvestment, like the ones shown in the gears, among others, have left many towns, like the photo shown here, um, and cities with unhealthy retail options. And so, um, I think for so many of us, these, these images uh, really ring true for what we see in our communities. Um, and I also want to end with uh, this slide and encourage you all to think about some tools or models or resources that um, you've used or are familiar with that also address health equity. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Maureen who will um, help us wrap up with uh, some additional tools from Prevention Institute. Maureen? Thank you so much, Laquana. And I think this question, you know, you can feel free to put it in the chat box or, you know, just some food for thought because there are a lot of different tools out there. I think there's a lot that we're seeing um, in, in more recent years that are really trying to kind of focus on what it means to collaborate effectively and what it means to really kind of suss out the, the pieces that are happening in our communities around access to care, transportation, built environment, and so on. And the tool that I wanted to focus our attention on today, um, but just giving a kind of a brief overview for the sake of time, is our Thrive Tool. Um, our Thrive Tool um, is a way for communities to be able to really be articulate some of the inequities that they're seeing, um, some of the ways that the community det determinants of health are impacting health outcomes, and um, be able to um, then kind of move toward, well, what does it mean for us to take action? THRIVE is also an acronym for the Tool for Health and Resilience in Vulnerable Environments. That's what the kind of full name stands for, but you'll see it often referenced as as Thrive. And the tool is organized into three interrelated clusters that you can see here. The first one on the left hand side being people, which is the social uh, cultural environment. The second one is place. This is really about the physical and built environment, kind of similar to some of the images that Laquana was showing earlier. And then uh, thirdly, equitable opportunity, the economic and educational environment. And so when we kind of break down um, the three, three clusters, we can see that the clusters are comprised here of 12 community level factors. 
For the purposes of time, we won't go through every single one of these factors like we would if we were doing um, a full day training, but we do encourage you to take a look at this tool that you can access for free on our website. And this has all of the different definitions and how communities have used this tool uh, for all of the different uh, 12 factors within the, the three clusters here. So let's walk through um, the, the place cluster. This is really in line with some of the recommendations that Vivian pointed out earlier around um, creating equitable community design and developing communities in a way that acknowledges um, that place matters. And so we'll kind of focus in on um, the uh, kind of getting around portion of place, but just as a quick definition, we can define place as the physical environment in which people live, work, play, and go to school. Um, and this includes these seven factors here that are listed out. Um, so again, in the interest of time, we're going to focus on one factor during the session, which is getting around. And the way that we define getting around is the availability of safe, reliable, accessible, and affordable ways for people to move around, including public transit, walking, and biking. And so a piece that we wanted to point out here is that when communities have a lack of safe, reliable, um, and affordable ways for people to move around, these are some of the associated illnesses and injuries that occur. We know that there's higher rates of asthma, cardiovascular disease, hearing loss from um, uh, transit, traffic crashes, and pedestrian injuries. And we like to be able to kind of bullet this out for folks because oftentimes these are not isolated incidents. A lot of the time when we think about these illnesses and injuries that are associated with um, inequitable transportation options, they're um, happening in combination with one another. So here's a real world example of how Thrive was used to positively impact transportation and um, this getting around factor within Thrive. When people um, often think of California, they tend to think about the San Francisco Bay Area, or they tend to think of like Malibu in Southern California, but there is an entire central region of California that is very rural, um, very low income, um, has a higher Hispanic population, similar to some of the communities that Vivian mentioned in Kentucky, um, and so they have more limited options to health. So in this example from Planada, California, which is an agricultural, uh, mostly Latino California town, a local nonprofit youth thrive to engage youth members that was named the Student Education Empowerment Development Squad, also known as SEEDS, as you can see here. So they asked the youth to take photos of their environment and community, and this helped the youth see what the roots of poor health comes were in Planada. And then they use these photos to start a conversation about what's going on in Planada, um, how the community determinants are impacting health, and then identify where to focus their efforts. So Thrive in this case was really a framework to help um, really articulate what they were seeing and what was happening in their community. And with that, they chose safe routes to school. They decided that a zone in school areas that doubled speeding fines would dissuade speeding um, by, uh, having uh, the schools raise money for safer infrastructure, such as sidewalks. To build awareness of these ideas, they had a table at a transportation forum where they displayed multiple photos that they had taken um, of streetscape designs that depicted safer, greener options for Planada. And the use work ended up swaying the county supervisors to get the planners to do something. And they identified steps to improve community determinants. Um, the SEEDS youth also wrote opinion pieces they presented to their county board of supervisors. They even testified before the California Senate Transportation and Housing Committee and worked on a Caltrans environmental justice transportation planning grant. And so the county board of supervisors ended up approving the pedestrian plan. Um, and I know that the participants are still um, in the process of approaching and refining um, this plan um, in the legislation session for the state of California. So this, this example just shows that we can take the data that we have, um, we can really look at that in combination with some of the community determinants of health that are happening in our own communities to identify where those inequities are, are taking place and then develop an actionable 
um, uh, oriented plan by advocating with youth and being sh sure that youth are at the table, residents are at the table to really define and suss out where those, those issues are. So I'll leave us today, I know that we're right at time um, with our report, Countering the Production of Health Inequities. Um, we don't have a ton of detail to go into this report as well as some of the other tools that we mentioned, but I just wanted to, to say that we'll be covering this in a lot more detail on our full webinar on July 11th. Um, this highlights policies, laws, and practices related to each determinant of health that have inadvertently or by design contributed to inequities, and then also um, highlights a, a system of equity that we all can be um, using um, and kind of tailoring for our own communities that we're working in um, in Kentucky and across the nation. So with that, um, in just the second that we have left, um, I wanted to just open it up. If there's any additional questions, feel free to hang on the line. If folks have to jump off, that's okay too, but we want to be sure that we're being responsive to any questions that may have come up um, during our webinar today. Thanks so much, and if folks want to chat in those questions, we can get you the answers. Later, please do join us. Um, other upcoming Health for a Change, that July 11th one, where we'll be, be digging deeper into some actions we can do in our communities to um, address health disparities. Please do take a moment to complete the post-event survey. I'll send it out this afternoon. And again, I'm honored to work here at the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky, where all of our events are posted to our website and our reports. And I look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, great. Uh, Presentations from each of our speakers. Thank you, Vivian, Matt, Maureen, and Laquana. Please reach out to us. We're happy to help, and we look forward to working on improving health equities in Kentucky. Thanks again for being on the call today. I hope everyone has a great afternoon.